course not. But every day we can be sowing seeds, almost without realizing. So it's not necessary to get all tense and think, oh, you know, what should I achieve this week, necessarily. It's the, it's the attitude of Gohonzon, I want to achieve something valuable today. That's all. In Gongyo in the morning, I want to live this day in the way Nichiren Daishonin would be really pleased for me to live it. Another way, of, another way of expressing the same thing, isn't it? With that determination in a natural way, we'll find ourselves opening up some sort of path which leads towards change, change for the better, change for people's happiness and so on. This is Kosen Rufu. This is the importance, too, of course, of NSUK. This is the importance of the New Century group. It's all natural, you see. It's not like someone standing on a touchline, whipping everyone up and then saying, go. It's natural, provided we practice, provided every day we chant Daimoku and activate our Buddha state. It's natural. But it is important to be aware that you all have a mission in terms of your work, as well as a mission in terms of, you know, running a chapter in Newcastle or whatever. You have a mission in your work, and the Gohonsen will lead you to it. If you all understand, good. So we have to gradually see this rigid education system change. We have to have an education system that is created for today and tomorrow and the next day and not for, you know, 50 years ago or 30 years ago. Swamped by the technological revolution. If you look at Japan, they have their problems. They have a rigid system that is even more rigid than ours. And worse still, you know, high uh, educational qualifications are far more important if you're going to make anything of yourself in the world of commerce or industry or whatever in Japan than they are here. So it's become a prestigious, a matter of prestige. Parents are ashamed if their children don't do well. So they put incredible pressure on them. It's really awful. The highest rate of child suicide is in Japan because of this. A child will be made to get up, of course not every child, but there are plenty doing it, get up at four o'clock in the morning, go to a crammer's. From the crammer, they go on to their school. And when they get out of school, they go on to another crammer, cramming in other subjects before they finally get home absolutely exhausted. And what is this all for? It's for the prestige of the parents. Nothing else but that. Well, this is awful, but it exists. We have our problems, Japan have theirs, the French have theirs, and so on. Every, actually, it seems to me, everywhere in the world, education is in quite a big mess. So there's lots of wonderful work to do in it. So you who are involved in the educational world, whatever it may be, you, know, you will have a fantastic life if you approach your job with that attitude. What can I achieve of value today? Even if it's only just sowing a seed or a thought in someone else's mind. Well, if you're a member of the Soka Gakkai, you're still in quite, in quite a minority 
compared to the population of Japan as a whole. So, uh, although, of course, in the Gakkai, they are doing all sorts of things, especially the education division, to try to bring parents, non-member parents, to see this more clearly and the harm it can do. Uh, but still, this is, you know, there are many, many people in Japan who are not practicing this Buddhism. So the Gakkai is trying to educate people to understand the dangers of the present system. But it still exists, and it'll take time to overcome it. In a sense, it involves a whole change in the outlook of Japanese society in terms of not pinning everything on the qualification, not pinning a family's prestige on it, and so on, and bringing people back to humanity. Hmm? So in the, uh, this book, the two authors try to consider what ways, fundamentally, education can have more independence, so that they're able to bring about these reforms. And they suggest three things. It's not our job this afternoon to consider them, but I'll just mention them. One, one is certainly, it would be a wonderful thing if it could occur, is that education should be autonomous in the same way that the judiciary, the judges, are uh, absolutely independent of normal day-to-day -day political pressures. Of course, that's a great idea. I'd vote for it, uh, but it'll take a bit of doing. The other is to make schools self-supporting by means of endowments so that they, they have the funds to be able to conduct their affairs, in, their affairs in the way they feel is best for their particular children and for their particular part of the country. And that they are not controlled in, respects of, in respect of finance by neither the national central government nor local government. Because that is why, of course, Everything is biased at the moment because the government thinks only of the economy, nothing else but the economy. And local government is compelled to do the same, really. So these pressures mean that everything is sacrificed for the sake of the economy. They think, but all they're actually doing in the end is breeding a whole lot of narrow-minded specialists who in the end will bring this country to a halt a grinding halt because they haven't got big enough minds to deal with the real broad problems when they come up against them. So strange, isn't it? Another, the third way, was by having a totally independent body, not controlled by government, uh, who handle the grants, both to students and to schools. So anyway, this is one of the things that the wisdom of human beings has got to solve in the future. So I think from there, Mr. Ikeda and Dr. Toynbee reached the point in total agreement that central and fundamental to whatever reforms are carried out in the future must be the supreme dignity of life. In other words, the most central principle of Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism. If the supreme dignity of each individual life is the prime point of consideration in all educational reforms in the future, then people will get it right. But you've got to get people to actually feel and understand that and follow it. In that way, certainly, the middle way can be found. So, of course, teachers also come into this. Although Dr. Toynbee talked about the Hippocratic Oath and the fact that teachers should also take such an oath to dedicate themselves and to make their profession and their obligation to the children the main point of all their actions, but despite that, of course, both agree that the, that the, the life of the teacher must be reasonably good. They must be free from basic worries such as constant debt and so on. And also the teachers must be given the space to be able to develop the qualities which we've talked about. 
they too have to train themselves. They too have to be educated and they have to have the time to do it. So, of course, when you get to, to a place like All Souls College, Oxford, Dr. Wilson, who I think every four years, every fourth year for him is what they call a sabbatical year. He can spend that whole year in the way he feels best in order to develop himself. That's incredible. But it doesn't apply, I believe, to ordinary teachers. <laughs> but maybe it should do. Are you keeping with me? All right. Good. So based on the supreme dignity of life, the system, whatever it is, should be that reward equals effort. Actually, this is fundamental, really, to the Buddhist view, because it's the Gohonzon's view, isn't it? Your reward when you practice to the Gohonzon is directly relative to your effort. So in a social sense, that applies uh, also in applying Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism to life. Reward should be commensurate with effort. Buddhism is not saying that reward should be equal for everybody. Buddhism is saying reward should equal effort. And I think that's fantastic. It's as it should be. So, how about moving on now to learning and studying that just a little bit more? So, of course, literature, as we've discussed, is very important. You can listen to the radio, you can watch TV, but actually you really don't learn necessarily an awful lot from it. You can get several books on one subject, can't you? All from different points of view. And you can learn from that and deepen your understanding of that particular subject through that means. But it's very unlikely you'll get several television programs on exactly the same subject. Each with a, uh, a director uh, or a researcher who's thought up the program, which is approaching it from a different point of view. So television is useful but books in the end are the most important point. I think we must all agree that. As I was saying earlier, you know, I was lucky because I was born before television was invented. So we could have great family evenings where everyone read. It was so nice. Enjoyable in every possible way. Fulfilling, warm, wonderful family atmosphere. And after a bit, we'd put our books down and then discuss all sorts of subjects that came out of what we'd been reading. It was great. I don't think life's any better, really, because of television. So we used to be able to sit in a room, you know, in different places, all looking in different directions towards each other, not all staring <laughs> every that way. Incredible difference. So I, I look upon those days of my boyhood with the greatest possible pleasure, even now, at this moment. Anyway, the television's here to stay, but I do think people are getting more perceptive, aren't they? Lots of people aren't watching incessantly and are reading books again. And certainly the book market is doing well, everybody tells me, so it looks like things are improving. Anyway, for us too, and as you know, Mr. Toda was insistent with Sensei about reading great books. We should do it. If we're going to be valuable in the future, if we're going to expand our lives and our view of the world, we must read great books. So I had a great time when I was about 13 to 15. Somehow then I read a lot of books. And some of them were quite big ones. 
I was telling the young men when I was about 13 years old, I can't remember what disease I had. I mean, it was measles or one of those things. But anyway, I read War and Peace then. And I, re I really enjoyed it. I really was totally absorbed by it. I remember it vividly and distinctly. It was the most enjoyable illness I've ever had. <laughs> because I enjoyed war and peace so much and I could go on and on and read it. So don't be frightened of these things. It just happened to be on my grandfather's bookshelf. So I just took it and started to read it. I didn't know anything about war and peace. It was only later that people started to say to me, are you reading war and peace? As much as say, poor little fellow. But I thought it was great. So don't, you know, be frightened of these books. Take them out and read them. They're, they're not... After all, they were written for human beings to read. They may be in a language that's a little bit different to the way we talk today, but still they're fantastic reading, a lot of them. The books that Mr. Toda insisted on sensei reading, like The Count of Monte Cristo. He also read Dickens. I don't like Dickens too much. One Dickens book a year would be enough for me. But on the other hand, they are great stories. And you can learn a lot about life 150 years ago from them. So I do really recommend it. Try hard to decide I'm going to do it. I'm going to get one great book out of the library and have a go at it. And if you don't like it, then go back and get another one. There are, there are plenty to choose from. <clears throat> I didn't read after that for a long time. <laughs> after I was about 15, I suppose I began to get a bit caught up with young girlfriends. And then I went to... <laughs> And then I, w then I went to, to, the, to the war, or to military college and the war, and there was no time for reading much during the war. And then after the war, I'd lost it. I was lost everywhere, really. Uh, I couldn't concentrate on books, but by the time I was 30, I was getting so worried about myself and my life and this awful, horrible, empty feeling that I started to read again. And that was made easy because I was commuting every day from Tunbridge Wells in East Sussex, in Kent, Kent's Tunbridge, I was living in East Sussex anyway, to London and back. It took about an hour and a half, sometimes even an hour and three quarters, and I really enjoyed it. No telephones, no babies crying, everything was great. Just there in my little cocoon on this train, reading these books. Cuzzo's doing it now, going to Chiselhurst and back every day. <laughs> it's good, isn't it, Cuzzo? <laughs> so then I started to read about life, and really it was philosophy, religion, uh, history, biographies. Those were the sort of books I was reading, but I always had one, and I always uh, enjoyed it. So really, Sensei's understanding today, his knowledge is extraordinary. I discovered this through this poem that he's written for members of the United Kingdom because uh, it was, as you know, written by him in Paris and he had no means of reference there. So he did it straight off the cuff and then he gave it to his translators and said, please translate it and if there's any point, you know, please just check. He probably said, please check this, this and this point, make sure that I've got it all right. So I started to get these telephone calls from the translators, you see, who obviously said to themselves, well, we don't know the answer to this one. Oh, Mr. Corston will know the answer. <laughs> and Mr. Corston didn't know the answer at, at all. So the first, the first time they rang, the question was, uh, Sensei is mentioning in this poem the rebellion, the revolution, of 1688. So my mind went a complete blank. <laughs> and I thought, 1688, that couldn't be Cromwell. Cromwell must have been about 40 years earlier than that. What happened after Cromwell? And my mind was going back to school. 
And I thought of Bonnie Prince Charlie. That was the only thing I could think of. And I couldn't answer it. But uh, in the end, I sort of thought it must be William of Orange. And then I thought, what extraordinary for Sensei to mention this. And they said, he has written in this poem something about the glorious revolution of 1688. Anyway, we got back onto London to John, and I asked him to check. And it was William of Orange, and it was called the Glorious Revolution. Because it was bloodless, there was no violence. And he uses this in the poem to show the, the greatness that exists innately in the British people, if they would only use it, really. That's what he's saying. You achieved an incredible bloodless revolution, you know, when everyone else had such bloody ones. That's really what he was saying. So that was one thing I learned out of that. And then another night they rang up and said, Miss Corson, there is a proverb, it's an English proverb, which Sense is quoting in this poem, and it, it's, it reads like this, Reason lies between the spur and the reins. Oh, I said. <laughs> I'd never heard it before. And I thought, I think Sensei's wrong. This must be, this must be a Japanese proverb. I'm, I'm, you know, something to do with samurai. I've never heard of that before. Anyway, that stumped me totally. So we got back onto Richmond again. And fortunately, Indra Adnan was uh, in, on duty at the Richmond Center. And she said, I'll go off immediately to the library. So she did. He came back, rang us, and it was true. It was an English proverb. There was just one word wrong in it. The correct proverb was, reason lies between the spur and the bridle. It's a great saying, isn't it? I don't know where Sensei discovered this or where he read it, but somewhere he did, and it appears in this poem. I'll never forget it, of course, now. And it's true, isn't it? That, is, that reason lies between the spur and the bridle. In other words, reason or wisdom is when you know whether to advance and accelerate or whether to hold back and take it slowly. In all aspects of life, this is, really is reason, isn't it? Wisdom. So anyway, that gives you an idea of uh, how Sensei has amassed knowledge over the years through Mr. Toda's guidance and how that knowledge has blended with his wisdom and comes out to help us. I mean, I've just given two examples. There are plenty more in the poem. Amazing understanding and knowledge. The authors go on and talk a bit now about intellectuals and the people. This is an important point, because either we think ourselves to be an intellectual, and in which case we're something rather special maybe, or we don't think we're intellectual and rather uh, feel uncomfortable in the presence of intellectuals. So I'll ask uh, Ilinka to read D. Ilinka, page 75. Page 75. Ikeda, many civilizations have preserved the distinction between intellectuals and the masses, but I think that modern society ought to discard it. We must adopt the premise that human beings are human beings before they are members of either the intellectual group or the masses. From this standpoint, it becomes clear that no demarcation line can be drawn between the two. People of the highest intellectual power lead roughly the same kind of daily life as all other human beings, and among the so-called masses there are people of the highest intellectual powers. A brilliant physicist may be no match for an ordinary housewife in balancing a domestic bu budget. Indeed, it may be only rarity that gives the physicist his great social esteem. Toynbee, the most important aspect of human beings is their common humanity. A human being has to be human before he can be any particular kind of human being, black or white, Buddhist or Confucian, Jew or Gentile, intellectual or lowbrow. 
The most important human experiences are universal and inescapable. Every human being has been born and is going to die. The difficulty of being a conscious living being and the mysteriousness of the universe in which we find ourselves are the same for intellectuals and non-intellectuals. Human beings of both classes are confronted by the same inexorable face facts of life and death. It is a symptom of social ill health when a society is divided into an intelligentsia and the masses, and when each of these two sections of the society feels that the other section is alien. Thank you. So this has been a problem a long time. In terms of Buddhism, as you know, uh, originally in the teachings before the Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni Buddha taught that intellectuals would never ever attain Buddhahood. They had such conceited minds that they would never, therefore, take faith in anything unless they'd analyzed how it worked. So he said, no Buddhahood for the men of learning <coughs> and the men of partial enlightenment, or as it's known, the men of the two vehicles. Then in the Lotus Sutra, he said that they could attain Buddhahood. But at the same time, of course, he said that the time for the Lotus Sutra to be of value to the people would be 2,000 years later in the age of Maha. And in the Ongi Kuden, that's the, the oral teachings of Nichiren Daishonin, Nichiren Daishonin points out that in the age of the latter day of the law, or Mapo, everyone is an intellectual. Everyone is a person of learning and a person of partial enlightenment. And this, of course, increases in degree as those centuries passed, didn't it? So the latter day of the law began round about, say, 900 AD. So then the world was really moving and expanding in an intellectual sense, leading up towards uh, the establishment of Christianity and Judaism and other religions in their highest sense, and also the Renaissance and all other aspects that followed. So in other words, because of the expansion of the intellectual capacity of people, everyone could be categorized as a person of learning or partial enlightenment compared with those very, very simple prim primitive peasants of uh, two or two and a half thousand years previously uh, at the time Shakyamuni was teaching the provisional teachings. So interestingly, Toynbee says, I believe religion is the field in which the intellectuals and the masses have the best chance of once again finding common ground. So, don't you think that our discussion meetings play an important part in that. I get worried because I feel people don't understand just how unique and important and great the discussion meeting is. Such a gathering of people from all different walks of life in one room, in someone's house, speaking freely and openly about their feelings and their views on whatever it may be, whatever human problem, whatever problem concerning the state of the world and so on. The discussion meeting is absolutely unique, but we're not proud of them. We are not proud of them. We sort of take them for granted. Sometimes, I believe, they're a sort of grind. Yet you have something in human terms which is totally unique. You won't find anywhere in this country such meetings going on. Not in one single other association, society, organization, or anywhere will you find anything like our discussion meetings. And yet we treat them often very casually. It's a shame. They're incredible things, discussion meetings. They're incredibly valuable in all sorts of different ways. 
there's a professor in Oxford who's been to discussion meetings for at least 10 years now. He doesn't practice, but he sees the uniqueness of the discussion meeting. So every other Sunday afternoon or whenever it is they hold their discussion meeting, he's always there. And he gets value out of it. He enjoys seeing so many human beings of different sorts together in one room discussing one subject. Intellectuals, people who perhaps consider themselves intellectuals, and also people who don't consider themselves intellectuals, every sort of type. I want us to become proud of our discussion meetings. I want you to realize, please, that there is no such thing existing anywhere else in this world except in Nichiren Shoshu Soka Gaka International. Please be proud of them. If we're proud of our discussion meetings, the discussion meetings will be great. But if we treat them as just another activity, they're not going to be. Please be proud of them and please talk that way and please educate others to understand their uniqueness and value. Then they'll be even more incredible. This is crucially important, isn't it? Because it is through the discussion meeting that people learn about Buddhism as well, of course, as individual. But more important still, it's a forum, isn't it? for airing people's views. It's a forum for us to be able to listen to people from many different uh, fields of life and society. Incredibly valuable things where human beings of all different sorts can get together and express their feelings really freely and honestly. And of course, apart from that, they can learn about Buddhism. So, uh, please let's try to start a new movement of the discussion meeting. Something to be proud of. That's what they should really be. Yes? Yes. Okay. Mm. Okay, well, you're all nodding your heads. Do something about it. <laughs> okay. Actually, we are going to spend a little time on, on UK summer courses, on uh, the whole business of discussion meetings. So I think you're absolutely dead right. I think that is right. So please, you know, if there are two or three young women in your district, you know, get them all together, say, let's chant Daimoku, and we'll really, you know, improve these meetings by developing great themes and interesting points to discuss, okay? I'm sure your district leaders will be pleased in the end. They may be a bit scared even at the beginning, because, it, you know, the thought of some theme which may seem uh, a little bit... Uh, you know, strong or whatever, may, may make them nervous, but you support them. The, 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 uh, the Go Show in the UK Express is used for your district discussion meeting, is it? Because the district discussion meeting... What? Kaza, can you make a little note there? I mean, it's a good point, isn't it? Actually, it would be much better if the Go Show in the UK Express was used for the group discussion meeting. The group meeting, rather, is specifically to help newcomers understand Buddhism. Hmm? To teach, you know, in any way necessary. The district discussion meeting, of course, is also to help new people to understand, but also it should have the distinct aim of 
uh, helping to deepen the faith and understanding of members. That is what the district discussion meeting is for. Great. Yeah. Thanks for telling me. Okay. Mm, great. Okay, well, that's what it is. So somewhere down the pipeline, everything is going astray, isn't it? Thank you very much for bringing it up. Anyway, we'll certainly take that one up ourselves, too. Good. So uh, we're just about running out of time. I think we've covered all the main things, except one question, which actually was from a young man, but I think it would be worthwhile... Uh, answering it here as well as with the young men, which I've already done. So I'll ask Elinka to read it out. If it is at all possible to tell me, I would very much like to know how you think the first NSUK school, secondary age range, will come into being. What processes do you think will be involved? Who will make decisions, etc.? Will it be, as you suggested today, that a group of teachers would decide to take this upon themselves, or will Sensei perhaps suggest the time and place? Thank you. Well, this is uh, one of the exciting things for the future, of course. Without a shadow of doubt, in the future, and not, you know, the future of so many, tens of thousands of miles away, uh, but in the reasonably near future, in the next five to seven years, we should definitely see the first of our schools established. <laughs> so, this is my, that's my itchinen. Actually, my itchinen is five years. But that's the point. These school, or this first school, will appear when the itchinen of the members of NSUK is strong enough to be able to initiate it and support it. In other words, there is a time. There is the right time for the first school to, be a, to appear in the rhythm of the movement for Costa Nufa of this country. But of course, through our itchinen, we can hasten the time, can't we? So the more people who, who desire to see an NSUK school, then that means the stronger the itchinen and the sooner it may come about. As to what sort of a school it will be, I'm sure in the future we shall have schools uh, at, at different levels of education. But probably we'll begin in a very small way, maybe with a sort of equivalent of a kindergarten or whatever you call them these days, and followed by a primary school. That's most likely, I feel. We have to start in a small way, not being too big for our boots, and from that we can learn great things which we can then apply to bigger projects in the future. But definitely, I feel it should be possible within the next five years to establish that first school, however small it may be. So please, if you're, if you're concerned about education, about having our own schools, please, you know, keep it in your itchinen strongly. The more the merrier, the sooner it will happen. So as to who, who will make the decisions finally, of course Sensei will, I'm sure, at some point, say as he usually does, Mr. Corson, have you ever given any thought to having a school in the UK? Like he said once when we, before we had a centre, you know. Have you thought about having a centre in the UK? And of course we had. But it was a sort of still... Uh, a sort of rather jelly-like resolve. Mm? <laughs> I'm sure one day he'll say that. But I hope, you know, we've really got our, our, our aims firmly and clearly established. When he does say that, we can say, yes, we have got the idea. Uh, you know, I'm really hoping we can achieve it, maybe, in a year or two's time. He can give his guidance, based on his own, of course, great experiences in Japan of establishing soccer schools there. 
So yes, please, as soon as possible. Yes. Block one can. But this, you're talking about Dr. Toynbee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well... I don't remember that. Anyway, what I think we'd better do, Karen, if you can dig it out for me from here, and then we'll answer it next session, okay, as a question. Uh, because I can't remember such a statement. Yeah, okay, we'll sort it out. But whatever happens, uh, you know, everything in the end should be for the sake of humanity, shouldn't it? One can't escape from that need. All right, everybody, I don't want to keep you over time because it's Saturday night and you've all got things to do. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. And thank you very much for being patient and listening. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <coughs> the, uh, the next session is uh, not on the 4th of July. It's on the 1st of August. Next session is on the 1st of August because of European summer courses. Mr. Corson will be away at the beginning of July. That was mine. We had to have it today. That's, well, one of the reasons also we had to postpone the one that was before to today. Okay, so the 1st of August, session number four, Buddhism and the Inner Self, pages 15 to 36. And the young women, if you could please be here at 12.45 on Saturday, August 1st. Okay, we'll start as usual with a uh, short gong at one o'clock. Thank you very much. Have a very safe and nice evening. Thanks very much, everybody. And if anyone needs reimbursement for travel from the regions, could they see Mr. Fuji, please? Yeah.